Hey folks, today we're going to talk about the periodic table. Specifically with the periodic table, we're going to be focusing on its history. Where did it come from? Why do we have it? Who came up with it? When did it, was it created, etc., etc.? So we're going to look at those things. What happens when you try and clean your room? Clean your room, you can't find anything, right? Organize my basement, heaven forbid, you'd never be able to find anything. Right? So our goal with organization, really what we'd like to do is be able to find things that we put there. Okay? So that's part of the purpose of organization. Now, we're going to talk about organizational skills. I want you to do not write these down. I'm going to give you 10 seconds, see if you can memorize them. Go. In order. Okay, were you successful? See if you can write it down on a piece of paper. Go ahead and pause the video, write them down, see if you can get them in order with all the spacing right, etc. Okay, welcome back. So, how'd you do? Here's the list. Did you get them in order? Did you get all the spacing right? Hmm, interesting. You know, part of it is when we organize things, we group things together, we can group things together differently. So now if you look at that line, you'll notice that you should be able to remember that line very easily now. Now, all the letters are in the same order, it's just the spacing that's different. So organization helps us remember things, and that's my purpose in doing that. The development of the periodic table truly was one of the milestones in the history of chemistry. Not only because it organized everything, and that is exactly what the periodic table did, is it organized everything. All right? But just as important, in fact, more importantly, it predicted the future. Think about why you watch the Weather Channel. It's not because you want to see whether it rained or not yesterday. You already know that. What you're trying to do is figure out what it's going to do today, or tomorrow, or over the weekend. Okay. So as you look at predicting the future, that's the concept of part of what the periodic table did for us back in the 1800s. There was a guy named Dobreiner, and I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but he was a German scientist back in the 1800s, and he classified some elements in triads in groups of three. Okay. And what he noticed is that each one of these had similar chemical properties. For example, if I look at lithium, sodium, and potassium up here, these three, one of the things he noticed was each one of them bonds once with chlorine. So lithium will bond with one chlorine, sodium will bond with one chlorine, as will potassium. He also noticed that when you look at the middle element, it is kind of an average between the chemical properties of lithium and potassium. Okay, And so it's average density, average atomic mass, etc. So, if we take the chlorine-bromine-iodine triad and you look at the two ends, which are chlorine and iodine, add them together, you get 162.4. Now, if you divide that by two, you get the average. And the average is 81.2, which is real close to the average atomic mass of bromine. So, you're able to say it's pretty close. Is it exact? No, but it's pretty close. There's another guy named J.A.R. Newlands. And back in 1865, they knew about 65 elements. Today we know about twice as many. There was no organization at all. There was no periodic table. Okay, So they were trying to figure out, he was trying to figure out how to organize it. And he noticed that if elements were arranged in order of increasing atomic mass, let me stop right there, increasing atomic mass, they did not know about protons, neutrons, and electrons yet. Okay, So as a result, they could only go by the mass of the different atoms that they found. So he noticed that if they arranged the elements in average atomic mass, that the properties of the third elements were like those of the 11th, and the fourth like the 12th. In other words, you'll notice they're separated by 8 every time. And that's what he noticed. Notice we're in 1865. Okay, kind of get that number in your head. Right? So he called this the law of octaves. Why octaves? Well, because musical notes, when you go up an octave, you'll go from an A to an A, or a B to a B, or whatever. So the pattern repeats every eighth element, so he called it the pattern, the law of octaves. Well, Dmitri Mendeleev came along, and you'll notice that he's only four years later, 1869, compared to Newlands, and he was a Russian chemist. And all the chemists talked to each other, and they all tried to build on the shoulders of the people who went before them. And Mendeleev and another guy named Lothar Meyer published nearly identical schemes for classifying the elements, in other words, periodic tables. But Nobody remembers Lothar Meyer. Right? Everybody remembers Mendeleev. And he's given credit for the per first periodic table. And in fact, if you look at your periodic table, and you look at element 101, 
you will notice it's Mendeleevium. It is named after him. Okay, so he got credit for it. Why did he get credit? Because he was first, frankly, explained it a little bit better, got out there first, didn't have to be much, a day or two, but that was enough to get him credit. All right, so Mendeleev's periodic table was arranged in order of increasing atomic mass. Remember, as we just said, back then they did not know about atomic numbers, they did not know about protons, neutrons, and electrons, so he did everything by atomic mass. Now, he found that when he did this, some of the elements didn't fit. All right? And so what he said was, the atomic mass must be incorrect. Someone must have measured it wrong. He said, my information must be right, theirs must be wrong. He noticed the periodic repetition of properties that Newlands did, and as a result, he created a periodic table. And this is a sample of what his periodic table looked like. All right? Now, this one happens to be from 19, 1872, so it's a few years later. But notice what you see. You'll notice, for example, that this R2O would be written now as R2O, but it says that lithium will bond. It takes two lithiums to bond with one oxygen. It takes two sodiums to bond with one oxygen. It takes two potassiums to bond with one oxygen. But over here, it only takes one beryllium, one magnesium, and one calcium to bond with one oxygen. So he organized these in groups, groups or families, where they had the same chemical properties. And he did it in terms of eights. So if you come across, you'll see eight different groups. Okay. Now, um, we just said that. He left blank spots in his periodic table because what he was doing was he was predicting the existence of elements that were yet to be discovered. Okay. So let's look at his periodic table again. You'll notice that right here, for example, we have something that's got a 68 around it. All right. We have another one here that's 72. All right. He said, well, I know that we've got copper, and it weighs about 63, and zinc has a mass of about 65, and arsenic 75, selenium 78, bromine's 80. So he knew about these, and he noticed that, that the properties of them, the properties of arsenic, fit this table up here. And the properties of selenium fit this table up here. So what he said was, it belongs in that table, so there's probably something missing. So he essentially took silicon, and he took tin, and he averaged them, and came up with something in the middle and said, Fish, there should be something here. I don't know what it is, but it should be something there. Okay, It's going to have properties that are similar to silicon, similar to tin, probably about halfway in the middle, and that's what he predicted for item number 72. Well, that element he called EKA, or first, silicon, and he put it below silicon on his periodic table. And it took another 20 years before germanium was discovered. Okay, And it had very close to the properties that Mendeleev had predicted for this EKA silicon thing that he had set was there. Did all of Mendeleev's predictions prove to be correct? No, not all, but most of them. And remember, part of his problem was he was working with atomic mass and not with atomic number. All right. So remember some of the other history. In the late 1800s, now we're, yeah, Mendeleev was in the middle 1800s, Thomson discovered the electron. And in the early 1900s, Millikan quantified the charge on an electron. Now you can see a YouTube video on that, which I reference in, um, in your worksheet list, okay, in your packet. Okay, so all of this was going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We're learning so much more about the atom. In 1930, there was a guy who came along named Mosley, who's a British physicist, and he developed the concept of an atomic number, i.e. protons. Remember that at this point, we don't have anything. Um, these are protons. Atomic number implies protons. Okay. And they hadn't known about protons before. So what he figured out was the correct way to arrange the element is by atomic number and not by atomic mass. So this was in 1913 when he figured this out. So we're about 100 years ago. Right. Now why does this make a difference? Well, let's look up here at our, our first list, for example, with uh, starting with germanium and arsenic and selenium and bromine and krypton. And notice that all of our masses are going up by a little bit every time as I go across from left to right. And I'll notice that my number of protons, that's what this is, that's my atomic number, 
is also going up from left to right. Well, notice here when I come down here to tin and antimony and tellurium and iodine and xenon, the atomic numbers are all going up, but look at iodine. Its atomic mass is less than tellurium. So, according to um, when um, Mendeleev was creating this table, he would have wanted to put it here. Now, Mendeleev was smart enough to realize that the that the properties didn't fit. So he left iodine over here, and he made the assumption that the mass was wrong. Well, the mass, in fact, was right, but no one knew about protons back then. Okay. So, Mendeleev's table was close, because generally atomic mass increases with atomic number, but that does not always happen. So now, Mosley and the people after him were able to come up with a periodic law. And the periodic law states... When elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, now guys, I can't stress that enough. That's very, very important that it's atomic number. Okay, it's not atomic mass, it's atomic number, it's number of protons. Then their physical and chemical properties show a periodic pattern. So, so long as we organize them by atomic number, their physical and chemical properties show us a periodic pattern, which leads us directly into the modern periodic table, which is going to be our next podcast. So, in summary for this podcast, you need to know about Dobriner, Newlands, Mendeleev, and Mosley, and that Dobriner had the idea of triads. Newlands came up with the law of octaves, of things repeating every eight um, elements. Mendeleev came up with the periodic table in 1865, very, very huge, important concept, and then Mosley came up with the atomic number in the 1900s. Okay, that's it. Hope you've been taking notes. Uh, go ahead and do the worksheet, and I'll see you in the class if you have questions. Have a good one. Bye.